Good morning, Fairfax. My name is Jacob, and I'm the Outreach Coordination Minister here. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. No matter where you are or how you're watching, thank you for making worshiping with us a part of your day. As we begin, I want to invite you to make sure you hit that like and share button. This is a small way to help us spread the message of Jesus to reach many more people and comment to let us know you're here. Those words of encouragement are huge for all of us. Whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, we'd love for you to comment and engage. In just a moment, we'll have a few songs in our communion devotional. So if you haven't done it yet, get your communion supplies ready as we break bread and share the cup as the body of Christ is scattered. Just a few announcements before we begin worship. Adult Bible classes began last week. It's not too late to join us. You can sign up on the Church Center app or through our website. The elders plan on opening the building for in-person worship beginning February 21st. With the COVID numbers dropping, they believe it is safe to return for those wishing to do so. Safety practices will remain in place as they were at the beginning of the year. If there is a change in the health trajectory before that time, they will reevaluate. If you don't feel ready to return to the building yet, that's okay too. Our online worship will continue as well. I also wanted to update you all on our Celebrate Recovery ministry. Many of you are aware of the CR leadership team's decision to go on sabbatical beginning April 1st of this year. Dave and Becky have served this ministry boldly and tirelessly for seven years now, and their lives are shifting them in directions away from leading in this ministry. As the rest of the leadership prays through new leadership and anticipates reopening the doors of this ministry to our community, we invite you all to pray with us for the leaders who will step into these roles and for Dave and Becky as they make this transition. I also invite you to consider whether the Spirit may be leading you to join the CR leadership team in some capacity or to join up with this ministry when we come off sabbatical. It is our hope and my conviction that God will raise the leaders needed to continue this ministry at Fairfax. Please join us in this prayer and reach out to me to learn more. Once again, I'm Jacob. Thank you for being with us. Now, let's join together in worship. Darkness around me, you are the hope to the hopeless. 
Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is my favorite account of Jesus. There's a truth in this passage that uh, we're not meant to come to the table alone. God made us to live in community with him. His spirit literally lives in us. And he made us to live in community with each other. That's part of this time of communion that we have now, that we do this together. You know, around the table of Jesus that day were a lot of sinners. And everybody knew it, including the people sitting around that table. But also not around Jesus that day were a lot of sinners. And everybody knew it too. It wasn't a secret, but these sinners, the Pharisees, they hadn't accepted it. Uh, They weren't real with their life. And they hid behind rituals and traditions and stale duty. And it kept them away from the communion happening at the table. Until we get real, we just watch from a distance. Don't let your fear of being known by God and being known by each other keep you from experiencing the full table that God has prepared for you. We're all here, sinners at the table. And Jesus, He doesn't get up and leave the table when we come streaked with stains. He wants us here, and he is the great and only healer. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. Let's pray. God, thank you for this wonderful community that you set up for us. Thank you for the relationship and connection that we get to have with you. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross that we can even come to this table. Um, And we thank you so much for each other. You know, there's a lot of hard times and circumstances that we walk through in life. And there's a lot of deceit in our sinful nature and, you know, things that we just really struggle with. And sometimes it's really hard to be honest and raw, not only before you, but with each other. And just thank you that there's this wonderful community that, you made for us that when we get real and raw that we're not alone and thank you for all the different ways in which you connect with us and and guide us and you gotta pray that in this time of communion we will connect both with you and with each other and that we won't stop here Um, connection with you is so amazing Uh, And just pray that this week we will be near to you and near to each other. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Malachi 1, verse 6 through 14. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar? But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice? Is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not let useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offerings from your hands. My name will be great amongst nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering, for my name will be great amongst the nations, said the Lord of hosts. But you profane it by saying, The Lord's table is defiled, and its food is contemptible. And you say, What a burden! And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, Shall I accept that from your hands? said the Lord. Curse be the chief who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared amongst nations. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Fairfax. We're so glad that you're with us. Uh, we are back upstairs in the window room. It's like coming home. That's right. Um, we uh, are taking this opportunity. There's snow happening behind us, and uh, we're glad you're with us. Last week, we started in studying through Malachi, talking about loving what God loves, just the first five verses of Malachi chapter one, and talking about how God loves his people. And we're, we're, in the month of love and talking about love, that's a buzzword that happens. We want to talk about what does love really look like. Right. So this week, we go on to the next section, which is loving God's name. <laughs> and Phil, what are your thoughts on it? This is huge. I mean, this is a huge a topic. topic. I mean, when we get into this passage, and like you you heard the passage already read, we're, we're here in Malachi 1 and then going into chapter 2, and God's not happy with his people. It, not happy at all. And specifically his, his religious leaders, right? He's, he's getting on to the priests because they're doing something that, they, that he had never intended for them to do. And that is, they're, and the crazy thing is this, they're, they're going to worship. Yeah. They're praying the prayers. They're having the religious festivals. They're doing all that you, you're supposed to check, let's do, yeah. right? But he says, you're, you're, you're not portraying my name properly. Yeah. It, it is not the way I have intended to, to be. And so he goes through a whole process here. He's, uh, verse 11, as we've read already, for from, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, mm -hmm. says the Lord of hosts. Not simply to the Israelites, but to the nations, yeah. to all mankind. Because of what you're doing and the way that you are worshiping me, my name is going to be great, and you are causing an issue with that. There's a fracturing there. But but what is it? What is that fracture? Yeah. And, and that's where, where he's trying to help them understand, you can come before me. 
with this flattery, mm -hmm. but it ain't flattery. Mm -hmm. It is because what you're doing is you're portraying a name, but it isn't mine. That's right. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the second key word here, Lord, written in all capital letters. This is the personal name of Israel's God. We first learn the meaning of this name in the story of Moses and the burning bush in the book of Exodus chapter 3. God appears to Moses and he commissions him to liberate the Israelites from slavery. And so Moses wonders, what if people ask the name of the God who has sent me? And so God responds, tell them, Ehyeh has sent me to you. Now, that Hebrew word Ehyeh means I will be. In other words, God's name means that he is the one who is and who will be. God's existence doesn't depend on anyone or anything else. This God simply is. But it will sound kind of strange for Moses to go say to the Israelites, I will be has sent me to you. Only God can say, I will be. So in the next sentence, God tells Moses the version he should say aloud, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, he has sent me to you. Now, that word Yahweh is the ancient Hebrew form of the verb he will be. And this is the personal name of the God of Israel. It appears over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. Now, here's what's interesting. Over the centuries, Israelites wanted to honor the sacred nature of this divine name. So, as they read the Hebrew Bible aloud and they came to this name, they stopped saying Yahweh and instead started saying the Hebrew word for Lord, which is Adonai. Now this practice has been continued throughout the centuries and so later when people started translating the Bible into English, they adopted the same practice. Instead of spelling out the divine name, they translated it as LORD spelled in all capital letters. Okay, you got that? Good, because there's more. Ancient Jewish scribes wanted to prevent anyone from even accidentally saying this name aloud when you read the Hebrew Bible. And so they came up with a visual device to remind you to make sure you say Adonai. They took the four consonant letters of the divine name. These letters correspond to our English letters Y-H-W-H. Then they inserted the three vowels from the word Adonai and combined these together to create an artificial hybrid word, which if you pronounced it, it would say Yahuwah, but no Israelite ever said Yahuwah. It's simply a visual reminder to say the word Adonai. Now, it gets more interesting. Much later, Christian scribes came along who didn't know that Yahuwah was an artificial word. And so they began to say it aloud and spell it in their writings. This is the word that eventually entered into English as Jehovah, it's a word many people still use today. But the main thing is, the word Lord in all capital letters is an indication of the divine name. Don't confuse it with the word Lord in your English translations that's not in all capital letters. That is the actual Hebrew word Adon, which just means Lord or Master. This word can refer to people like kings or the master of a servant, even a shepherd over his sheep. And sometimes biblical authors will use this word to refer to God, like in the phrases the Lord of all the earth or the Lord of lords. But behind all of these words, Yehovah, Lord, Adonai, stands the original divine name of the God of Israel. It refers to the one who was, who is, and who forever will be. We read about that in the very essence of who God is all throughout Scripture, and you find that God's name is something that is caused to be kept in holiness. It's reverence, and he doesn't take that lightly. In fact, even Jews today, scribes, when they were copying the, <laughs> the law, when they would write the divine name of God, first they didn't say it, and second, after they did, they went to a new pen. Every time, new quill. Every time, they would start all over again because they revered God's name so much. Well, and, and they not only would go to a new pen, they would write a different word. Yeah, they never wrote the it's, divine name. It was too holy to write the divine name. So they would go to... Adonai. So instead of Yahweh, they would go to Adonai. And even Adonai at some point became so holy yeah. that they, they, because there was a sense of reverence from the beginning that they were supposed to have for the name of God. But it's greater than, and you and I have talked about this, it's greater than the idea of uh, you should never say OMG. Right. Because if you say OMG, um, 
you're saying God's name in vain and that's a sin and it's horrible and everything like that. It's And that's what we really want to talk about today. It's something much deeper than a word spoken from our mouth. Yeah, yeah that's, that's um, got to be what we're talking about, that loving God's name. Why God loves his name. How do we be people that love the name of God? And how do we live into what that means as followers of Jesus even? So... And, and you go up here in verse 14 and it says, For I am a great king. God can say that about himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Yeah. There's this deep reverence and fear for the name of God. And he goes down in chapter 2 to say, My covenant that I established with Levi, may stand and, and my covenant with him was one of life and peace and I gave them to him gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. And to and he, Levi, and the people with that were following Levi at that point from a worshiping God standpoint, they feared me. Mm -hmm. And he stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. And no wrong was found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity just by his presence with yeah. him and holding God's name in the right place. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now, we got to stop here for a second because who. In the New Testament, who are priests? We are. <laughs> what? We're all priests. So we're our lips and our presence should help bring people to instruction, knowledge, and the fear of God. Yeah. And if we look back what he's saying here, like in verse 6, you know, the, he's talking to the priests and they go, "What? Well, how have we despised your name? Remember last week they also said, like, in the beginning of chapter 1, they said, well, how have you loved us? And they're asking the same thing. How have we despised your name? And he says, you're offering polluted food upon my altar. You're bringing blemished animals for sacrifice. Your worship is, well, let's be honest, you're not giving me the best. You're coming in giving me what's left over. And I read that and I'm like, you know the law. You know what you're <laughs> supposed to do. Right. And yet... I find myself more fitting in there because the reality is how often do I treat the worship of God as an afterthought rather than my first thought? Like, what do I do first thing in the right. morning? I grab my phone, I turn off my alarm, and I don't think about God always. Sometimes I go right to Facebook, or I'm checking my bank account, or I'm checking something else. God is not the first thought in my mind. My worship in the morning also can become that coffee pot. You know, huh. it, you you take test my blood and you're going to find coffee as the main ingredient. Uh, I But I do not always put God first. And that's what's happening here. They're becoming lazy in their worship to God. As you go, but here was Levi, your forebear. He was great. And he, I love that he stood in awe of my name. Yeah, awe. And... And here's the deal. We got to really kind of lay, even, I think, a better foundation. Because it's not just this whole concept is not summed up in Malachi. Right. Mm -hmm. We've got this from book end to book end of Scripture. We have an understanding of God's name and why we're to bear it. Yeah. Okay, so let's go all the way back to um, Genesis. Okay. We could go to a lot of places in Genesis, but I'm going to take us to Genesis chapter 11 uh, in particular. Okay. And we, most of us know the very uh, particular time we've, we're talking about here, and this is the Tower of Babel, okay? And so all the people that are there are gathering together, and they said, come, let's build a, t a tower for ourselves, a city and a tower, with its top in the heavens. And here, listen to this statement, and let us make a name for ourselves, mm -hmm. lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So for them... Um, making a name for themselves brought security and power. Okay? We're, we don't want to disperse. We want to stay here. We want to stay secure. And we want to hold the power in our own hands. So let's build something for ourselves that makes a name for ourselves. And the Lord, as we know, comes down. He uh, scatters them 
He uh, confuses their languages for the first time, and then they're all scattered. But what's very interesting to me about this is that in that moment, right after the Tower of Babel, we go straight into the descendants of Shem. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. It wasn't a mistake, okay? Shem, the name of Shem is name, (laughs) all right? So we begin to get the descendants of Shem. What God is showing is I am going, I confused all these languages. You wanted to make a name for yourself, but I'm going to make a name for myself. And what I'm going to do is through Shem, show you a line of righteousness, of faithfulness, of myself. And through that line of Shem comes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and ultimately on down to Jesus himself, right? But before we get to Jesus, I don't want to skip to Jesus just yet. What do we find ourselves in in Exodus, right? Yeah. We find ourselves in Exodus. And so after God leads the people out and they come to Moses is following God's lead, they come to Mount Sinai. So he goes up to Mount Sinai and we're given the Ten Commandments. We've seen the Charleston Heston movie. We know the Ten Commandments. (laughs) But what happens there is that we, we read these things and we have the, the, the commandment says, you shall not bear the Lord's name in vain. Now, we usually know it as do not take, take the Lord's name right. in vain. Because there's that, that's a tricky word in that phrase in the Hebrew. And so what they did was they said, well, how do we make this work for us? And so <laughs> because they didn't understand how do you bear the Lord's name in vain. And so they put the word take. So we can tend to think that is speak. We don't speak the Lord's name in vain. Now, what's interesting is just a few chapters over, when God is giving the instructions to the high on how the high priest is going to function, and it's talking about what the high priest is going to wear. It talks about that he Aaron, the high priest, is going to bear a name on his forehead that says belonging to Yahweh, belonging to God. And this is tied to the headdress, but he also has this ephod, this garment that he wears. It has these stones that each represents a tribe of Israel. So there's 12 and there's six on each shoulder. And it says that he will bear the names of them before the Lord. So really what's happening is the high priest is representing the nations of Israel before God. And it's that same Hebrew word, bear the nations. They also do not bear the Lord's name in vain. And if that's what that commandment means, and it has implications that are huge. Oh, that's what we're talking about. Keeping the command not to bear Yahweh's name in vain changes everything about how we live, especially as followers of Jesus. Um, To bear his name in vain would be to enter and and this into, into the covenant relationship with him, but to live no different than the pagans around us. And that happened all throughout Israel's history. That's what's happening. Once again, in Malachi, he's like, look, you bear my name, but you are bearing it wrongly. You are taking it in vain. Right. Um, it's very similar to Saul taking the Ark of the Covenant without it being blessed by the prophet Samuel to go into battle. And just here it is. And uh, God didn't bless it. In fact, God removed Saul as the king because he bore the name of God in vain. He brought it for his own purposes. But he also smeared God before the nations. And you know, Wait a second. You're saying that we can bear God's name, but we're really bearing our own? Absolutely. You know, think about this. We talked, you're talking about Tower of Babel, but in Revelation chapter 3, um, God talks about that they're going to be marked with his name, right? It's the same thing. It's all a, we use the word hyperlink. That's what they use in the Bible project. <laughs> it's a hyperlink back to Genesis. Right, absolutely. And it's back to Exodus. And it's, here it is about you are marked, the high priest is marked with the name of God. But then we get a little further in there, and we've all heard of 666. That's the mark of the beast. Oh, it's the mark of the beast. And I know that there are some well-meaning folks out there um, who have interpreted that to be um, in various ways. Um, and sometimes, The number of the beast. Right. And, you know, <laughs> even vaccines, let's just say it out there, sometimes don't get it. It's the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the number of man. It ties back to the Tower of Babel. Okay. Yep. It ties back to the Tower of Babel where everyone spoke the same language, but they were all focused on themselves. Man. They were making a name for themselves. Right. 
666 is really, here's the number of man. And instead of it being, you're going to have that marked on who you are rather than having the name of God marked on you. It's the, it's the opposite. It's just like love. I love Jacob and I hated Esau. It's not that God hated Esau. It's just, this is the one he chose. This is the one he didn't choose. You're either choosing Yahweh or you're choosing yourself. And it's just, it's all throughout oh. scripture. The name of God is huge for our, the implications of who we are as followers of Jesus. You know, I'm not worried about some external thing marking me with the mark of the beast because I am marked with I'm the, the name beast. of Jesus. Here's the deal. Yeah. Here's the deal. The number of man represents the number of us. We're the beast. It's it's not Satan. It's yeah. not any of that. It is us trying to take over and make a name for ourselves. And this is the crazy part. When we really get into um, Malachi here and then looking at, like you were saying, Revelation and a couple other passages, where Malachi is talking to the people by the voice of God, and he says to him, he says, oh, God says this, Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So instead of writing God's name on our foreheads, God's going to take the mess from our offerings and wipe that on our face. Yeah. And so we either have a choice of what name we bear and what we want to put on our foreheads. The dung of our offerings that are not toward him yeah. or the name of God. So we take all of this and we go to, let's just say um, Philippians chapter two. And it says, all of you should have the very attitude of Jesus Christ, who himself being God humbled himself and became obedient as a servant. And because of that, because of his sacrifice, Jesus is given by God the name that is above every name. There's only one of those. Yeah. There's only one, and that is Yahweh. And at that name, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and in hell. Every person. And the only way that Jesus was able to take on that name, that God was able to give it to him, was he had to take the posture of a servant. That those who he was going to were the object of his love, not what he could receive from them. And then we get over here where Jesus is speaking to the churches uh, in in Turkey now, right? Tur the seven churches of Asia. And he's talking to them. And in, specifically in chapters two and three of Revelation, he says to them, I'm going to give you a new name. Yep. I'm going to write on this stone and I'm going to write on your foreheads a new name. And it's my name, the name that God gave me. I'm going to right on your foreheads. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to bear that name. No longer are you going to be looking to make a name for yourselves. You're going to become the name of my father to the nations. And then therefore, because of that, the world will come to know who God is. So it's this privilege and honor. So we have the choice. <laughs> do we want dung right wiped across our face? <laughs> Or do we want the name of God? And I'm sure a lot of parents are out there going, how do I explain that, Phil, to my parents, oh, uh, my kids? But the point is, is one of it's a mess and junk, and one of it is of pure gold, of Absolutely. wonderful incense, so that, again, what we're doing is bearing his name. So the big question is, is yeah. so what? So how do, how do we do, we do that? that? <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking about this. What happened at Pentecost on, in Acts chapter 2? is the opposite of what happened at Babel. It is now the disciples, the Holy Spirit descends upon them, and now they are speaking in tongues, and everyone is able to hear and understand the message, and it becomes reconciliation again. That's a big word. We use it all the time, but here it is. Here's what happened. And because now the name of God is on the people again. And it's no longer on the outside on a headdress or, you know, we don't have the paraphernalia, the red dot on the forehead or the you know, bike or the helmet, you know, that tells us this is who we belong to. It is now the Holy Spirit that lives within you. And how does this, the, the crazy thing for us to think about is at Pentecost, how does, how do they do that? What shall we do? Yeah. Peter, Peter, what shall, we hear this all, we're now hearing all this the, the roles have been reversed from Tower of Babel. Now we can all hear. We can all understand. We come from different name, uh, uh, nations, different languages, but we're all one people here. What binds them all together? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
The name is what bound us together in unity. And by bearing that name, all that our sin and our desire to make a name for ourselves has been destroyed so that his name can be displayed. So I guess a question that I would ask is what does it look like to improperly, to, to not correctly bear the name of God? No. What do you think of that? So I think when we're answering that sort of question, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I think right now, if we're thinking about it, if I'm going to go on my Facebook and I'm going to be unkind and I'm going to force my opinions, if I'm going to go and have a in, in-person conversation, if we get it, with people, and I end up arguing with them more about what I, what I, my opinion says, my political view, my, uh, my view on uh, this or that, and I'm pushing that and pushing that and pushing that. If I treat my family with anger and impatience, and I lack kindness and goodness, when I do any of that, I'm not bearing God's name. Mm-hmm. I'm bearing the name of Phil. Yeah. And my name, I know, in the depths of my soul, is is tarnished without Jesus. Yeah. And and I think that's where we struggle today. But when we get when we get to it, really, it's this. It's a matter of uh, posture and presence. And by the way, with posture and presence, it's both good and bad. Let me explain what I mean by posture and then by what I mean by presence. Posture. How do we approach both God and how do we uh, approach people? Uh, one ap- uh, uh, approach, one posture towards God is, God, what can you give me? What can you give me? What can you give me? How do I get to heaven? Please, God, give me all that I want and all that I need. Hmm. Okay? And then that same approach and posture I do with others. So I go to them. What can I get out of you? What can I get out of you? What are you going to give me? Oh, oh, I want to marry you, but it, I want to make sure I'm going to get from you in this marriage what I want to get out of this marriage. I'm going to have kids, but I want to make sure I get out of my kids what I want to get out of my kids. I'll make you my friend, but boy, what are you going to give me in that sort of relationship? Posture. The reverse of that posture is to say, God, what can I give you? You have given me everything. So all that I am and all that I have is yours. What can I give back to you? And in return, when I look to others, it's not what I get, it's what I can give. How can I give to you what is so richly been given to me? Mm-hmm. Posture. And then presence. I bring a presence into every relationship I'm with. Every person I'm with, I bring a presence. And that presence is all either bearing my name. Look at Phil. Look at what I'm giving to you. Aren't you blessed? <laughs> by my presence. My wife would say she's blessed by me. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw it in. Um, or the presence of God. If I am bearing his name, yeah. and if I'm bearing his name to people, they feel his presence. And I guarantee you, Robin and I were talking about this today. I know my family's out there watching and going, I bet they don't really know dad, you know. Uh, Angie's going, yeah, let me tell you about the real Phil. And that's the deal. My family knows what presence I bring. It there's no way to there's no way to hide it. Mm-hmm. I'm either bringing presence of Phil, which is sinful and, and hurtful, or I'm bringing the presence of God, and it changes them because it's not it's not drawing them to me. It's drawing them to Him. Yeah, posture, I think, presence. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, you know, I I can get up there and preach. I can sit here in front of a camera and talk about these things, but if if my character and who I am when I'm home, my kids and my wife see me respond in a way to them that's so contrary to who I put out in front of other people. First, I'm being that hypocrite who's <laughs> changing masks, but I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in all of those situations. Um, you know, I, one of the things that uh, I think of how this looks is, and we talked about this last week, and we're going to talk about it several times throughout the year, but we have this mentality that church is supposed to be comfortable, that <laughs> I want to be comfortable. If there's something that makes me uncomfortable, then it must be wrong. Um, and because we've settled for comfort, we tend to treat the church as if it is like um, you're 
grocery store. If they don't have what I like, I'm going to go find it somewhere else. And I think what followers of Jesus, it should be covenant before comfort. Right. Um, if the church is going to survive and going to thrive in the 21st century, if Robin is going to survive and thrive as a follower of Jesus Christ in the 21st century, I need to be willing to demand more um, and be dem- have more demanded of me. I need people who are going to say, listen, you're not living in the name of God. Look, we talk about disagreement things. We disagree all the time. All the time. You know, but disagreement without any move towards reconciliation is a problem. And without love. Right. Right. And the question is, when we talk about bearing God's name, and Phil said it near end just a second ago, who am I drawing people to? If I'm drawing people to me, then I am bearing my own name. If I'm drawing people to God, God is bringing people to himself. Now, it doesn't mean that people won't like you and people won't follow you and be friends with you. It also doesn't mean that people will like you and all these other things. But at the same time, you are God is, says, I, Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. And it's not going to be because, because of me. It's going to be in spite of me but and through me. Right. And so we have an important role here. We need to call followers of Jesus from being individualistic, um, just me and Jesus faith junkies to being we're in a community of believers. And we want to boldly show Jesus together. It's not something we do in isolation. And and we're going to talk more about this because when we come come back to Malachi, you know, this is learning how to love like God loves. Right. Yeah. And next week, we're really going to ta- tag into um, marriage, <laughs> the idea of marriage and why God brings that up so much through Scripture. But today, I just briefly, as we f- kind of start wrapping things up, um, we, you and I were talking about how this links so much to what it's like in our relationship with God and marriage. I, it's like making a choice between living with God and marrying him, living with Jesus and marrying Jesus, mm-hmm. cohabiting with God, or making him your your spouse. Um, because when we have this idea of cohabitation, well, we want all the benefits of marriage, mm-hmm. but not the commitment that goes along with it. Because at any point, if the give and take is not good enough give and take, well, then I can deem it unnecessary and go elsewhere. So I'm, a lot of us, I think, are great with cohabitation with God. We're willing to live with Him. We, th- we know benefits that He's going to bring us. Uh, it's going to be enjoyable at times and things like that. But to make the full-on commitment and to really bear His name is, I don't know if that's for me. But when we enter covenant, like what you just said, enter into covenant with Him, it changes everything. I think back to, think about when Mary and Angie married us, right? They took on our name, and it was a name that was no longer my name. It was our name. Yeah. And I remember Angie having to go through the crazy process of getting her, her license changed with her name, her bank accounts changed over, her title on her car, her passport. Everything changed yeah. because we became one in that moment. We chose not to cohabit. Right, Not to cohabitate, but to marry and to make covenant with one another. And ultimately, are we willing to do that? Again, our posture and our presence will tell us that. We'll tell him that. We'll tell the world that. And just like what's happening with those priests, their job was to go and bear the names before Yahweh. And you and I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to bear the name of God among those that I am around, but I also am encouraged because of that to pray for those who are in our church body, to lift others up. That's something, what, what can we do during COVID? What can we do during COVID? You can pray. Mm-hmm. You can pray for those who persecute you, pray for those you haven't seen, pray for those you know who are lonely or hurting. Like That is also bearing the name of Yahweh. And so, Bearing, being image bearers of God is who we are because of creation. Being name bearers are, are, are who we are because of Jesus Christ and because of the Holy Spirit that's been. I, I love Paul says this in Ephesians. It is a guarantee. It's a it's a deposit of of your life with Him that you have been brought from death to life. And you know, dead people don't bear the name of, of Yahweh. People who are alive do. 
And, and Jesus specifically, in Revelation 3 that we talked about, he calls them, he says, to those of you who are conquerors. Yeah. Those of you who are conquerors, who have um, walked with me in victory, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a new name. So, Phil, why don't, as we end today, why don't, why don't you pray for us all that we can be, that we can bear the name of God and all of this, that we love the name of God, that we love it so much that it changes how we live. And, you know, let's, let's just end with prayer today. If as And I want to encourage everybody as we pray, hold the hand of your family members. Um, if you, no one's there with you, hold the hand of God <laughs> because he is. Um, we, we are never alone. Mm. And in the, this moment, let the presence of God be felt in your home. Yeah. Let's pray. God, we know you are with us. You are not a God who is far off, but one who is extremely near. So near that you dwell within our hearts and that day by day, moment by moment, teaches us we are never alone. We are so thankful for that. And right now, God, I just want to pray for each of us. Help us to choose to bear your name instead of making a name for ourselves. Help us to choose to allow you to write a new name upon our heads and upon our hearts. Help us, motivate us to choose to to marry you rather than just to live with you and to cohabitate with you. And in doing so, our name changes and so does our life. Every bit of who we are, is wrapped up in your identity, not our own. As we go out, may our posture toward you and toward others be one of giving and love rather than on what I can get and receive. May our presence not be our own, but help us to give, uh, uh, give your presence to everyone that we come in. Let that presence be felt in our love joy, our faithfulness, our goodness, our kindness, our patience, all those things that are a fruit of the Spirit, may they be displayed in our presence toward others. That's when we'll know we're truly bearing your name. We pray this in the name that is above every name, that at that name every knee will bow. In that name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's been a joy to be together and to sing and worship God and to encourage one another. I have a brief announcement, and then there's a passage I'd like to read to you. Uh, This month, I will end my second term as an elder and will be going on sabbatical. I don't know what I'm going to do after this year. Uh, I'm going to consider that and pray for that over the next uh, 12 months, but I have really enjoyed serving you and watching God work among us. Uh, It's amazing how uh, he has changed the way we look at those around us and at one another. And uh, it's been a joy to be able to watch and experience that myself. The passage I want to uh, read this morning is Philippians 4, verses 4 and following. It's a passage that um, it was my dad's favorite passage, and I can remember even as a very young uh, young man uh, going and listening to him preach. This was his go-to sermon, um, spoken in many places, and he really was someone who um, lived this and expressed this. Uh, and if you got to know him while he was around, uh, you would know that he did have a joy about him all the time and shared that uh, with those around him. Uh, he's given me a little bit of his sense of humor, uh, but I don't, I don't have that natural temperament of happiness. I'm a little bit more serious in my tone. And so this p- passage has always been a, an encouragement to me, but also a, a, a challenge or something to try to achieve. So starting in verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. God bless.